Thank you very much. And I, I should warn you that if you were challenged by David's talk, um, you'll be shitting bricks after this one. <laughs> to use a technical term, I always like to defer to technical terms. Um, there is an even later book that just came out this week virtually on social ecology, which I'm involved with. So if anybody wants to see that afterwards, um, or if you wanted to continue to read it during. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I want to do this evening is, um, is certainly not tell you about permaculture, because you know about permaculture. Although there may be some things I will talk about permaculture that um, are things that I'm particularly knowledgeable about. But I want to challenge you to think in the context of the title about permaculture le providing leadership for sustainable futures. What's really needed if we actually want to achieve sustainable futures and, and if permaculture can play an even greater role than it has up to this point in time? And so I think we need to we do need to see some new things, but we need to think differently about a lot of the things that we already see. I find that I go through three stages of perception um, when I start thinking about things. Um, so the first stage is, in a sense, deceptive simplicity. And it was explained to me by a medical doctor most clearly. He said, think of it like this. You don't suffer from a headache because of a deficiency of aspirin in the blood. And that's the sort of deceptive simplicity that runs our society. We build prisons for criminals and we build hospitals for people with cancer, but we don't suffer from, pr from crime because of a deficiency of prisons or cancer because of a deficiency of hospitals. Um, we're constantly trying to find deceptively simple solutions. And pesticides for pests is, I guess, the most classic one. Um, when you start thinking about this, you get into another stage that I call confusing complexity. And it's a stage that often people get paralyzed in. And I sort of noticed it when you were asking for volunteers. You know, the, there was a sort of paralysis <laughs> that spread through the group. You know, partly not knowing exactly what's involved and not knowing what's going to be in the future for you over the year and da 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 da. Um, what you've got to get to is the third stage. You've got to go through confusion to get to the third stage. Yeah. Um, and the third stage I call profound simplicity. Um, and, and it's when you say, OK, I'm going to do it. Um, as a teacher, my primary role is to confuse my students. Because I know if I've confused them, I've got them out of deceptive simplicity. It's deceptive simplicity that's got us into all the messes we're in. You know, people who say, oh, this is what we need. You know, nuclear power is the answer, or, or even solar energy is the answer. All those naive, simplistic, one-answer solutions are not the answer. Um, it, they're deceptive simplicities. Profound simplicity is not something you can teach. It's something that um, you have to do a lot of homework for um, and you're on your own. And eventually, you get to a point where it's really something related to wisdom. And I'm going to come back to that. And th the real essence of good permaculture is based on wisdom, not on cleverness. And again, I'll, I'll come back to that. So just so you can see, I haven't changed much from you know, when I started out. I was thinking about permaculture at that moment, actually. And, um, <laughs> I said, I wonder if those folks in Tasmania are going to catch up with me on this, but they pretty good. Um, so you can see, like some other people here, I came from England or Britain originally, and um, was always interested in those sort of things related to nature. And so we grew, grew our own food, and we lived in the country, and I kept lots of pets. Um, mostly sort of local animals <laughs> that wanted it, <laughs> not, not your conventional pets. <laughs> um, 
and um, I, I was eventually thrown out of school as unfit for further education um, because I wasn't thinking about the curriculum. I was thinking about the world and all the other things and that's again the sort of thing in many ways that you need to be open to not just the formula that somebody else has come up for you um, but, but your own path of learning. So next one please. So these are those books that Pat mentioned and because she's mentioned them I won't go on so we could go on to the next one and, and as I say there's a new one on social ecology. Um, and the next please. Um, in some ways where I'm going is that we live in a society that is what I call a socialising society. It's a society where one generation plans what the next generation should do. That's what a curriculum is in the school. Um, it's what happens when you raise children. You think you know what they need to be doing. Um, and it's a socialising process. It's my learning agenda for you, if I'm the, the, the previous generation or the teacher. Um, we're over-focused on problems um, and, and the, and the me me measuring of problems, not so much the solving them, <laughs> but it's what I call monitoring our extinction research. As a researcher, I can get any amount of money to measure problems. If you look at the government, and you look at all the money they spend on the environment and you say, how is it actually spent? And you go and do a lot of research into it. Most of it is actually going to measure the problems, <laughs> not, to, not to actually do anything about them. Um, and then we have exclusionary social institutions. Um, most people feel fairly impotent when we want to bring about change. So if you press the next one. What I'm arguing is we need to eventually get to what I call an enabling culture where we enable people to achieve their potential, children to learn what their, their agenda is to learn and to instead of try to continually solve problems in maldesigned systems is to design systems that can work or redesign present systems so that they can work and lead to well-being and health and nourishment and all those sort of things. And we need a participatory social set of institutions, which we're going to be helped by Kat and her advocacy group to get there. <laughs> um, so in a sense, what I'm arguing for is a movement from these three things to these three things and various other things that are associated with those, those things. But this is, in a sense, where I'm going. So why I'm putting this up at the beginning is saying if permaculture is going to make a difference. It's actually got to broaden its sights to include those sort of things as very clear sort of things to, to include in discussions and, and weekend activities and so forth. So just a, a, a small word about permaculture. Um, these are just four things that um, I think are really important about permaculture. Um, this idea that it has, has a set of ethical, ethical um, foundations and ethical testing questions distinguishes it from a lot of other endeavours in our society and I think that's very important. Um, it's an ecology holistic based design approach to things so it's completely in line with what I just said we need about taking a design approach to, to things and, it, and th that's applicable to everything. Um, it's also a collective endeavour as we see here even though you're a bit slow to volunteer, <laughs> some of you. Um, so and there are training programs and resources and, and books and, and magazines and websites and all these sort of things and networks and that's a really good thing. And another one, um, which this is, is more a hope and related to my, what I'm going to talk about mostly, um, that if permaculture is going to really reach its potential, I think it's really important that it be open to its, itself as an organisation being in a process of transformation and change. 
And so to think about that, I often think of permaculture that we have now as permaculture one, and the question then is, what is permaculture two? What would that be like in terms of progressing permaculture from the stage that it's at at the moment to, to a, bigger, a bigger picture of permaculture? Um, oh yeah, uh, that last one, <laughs> yeah, I guess go back to that last one. Um, many, many years ago, to, to address that, I came up with this term, permaculture of the inner landscape. Because when I went to the early conferences on permaculture in North America, which was back in the 80s, 70s and 80s, I suppose, um, or 80s mostly, um, sometimes I was a bit shocked by some of the individuals who were sort of doing permaculture out there, but there wasn't the permaculture going on in here. Um, and there was a lot of sort of inappropriate behavior. And so I started running workshops at those conferences on what I call permaculture of the inner landscape. And so I was trying to look, in a sense, at the psychology and the emotional aspects and the soulful aspects, etc., of permaculture. So this is just an image to connect the inside and the outside, that what goes on inside affects what goes on outside, what goes on outside affects what goes on inside, and they're an ongoing spiral interrelated process. Yep. This is an, there, so at the beginning of this talk, I've just got a few very general sort of concepts that are really underpinning much of what I want to say. This is another one of those concepts is that quite often when people want to do something, um, they say, let's get together and see if we can come up with some plans. And that's usually what happens. Um, what happens in terms of outcomes is if, and this is what happens at, on, in a political level, when people do that, they essentially come up with a minor modification of the old plan at the most. So if we go on down, um, that's right. Underneath plans are ideas and imaginings, and underneath those are feelings, and underneath those are our worldviews and values and beliefs. And over probably 40, year, 40 or so years, I've been working with farmers throughout the world, and when I meet with them and I sit down, I don't sit down and talk about plans. I meet with them and I talk about their beliefs and their values and their feelings. What do you love about farming? What do you love about producing livestock? What do you love about um, producing soybeans or the soil or whatever it is or where you live? And that's where you have to spend most of the time if you want to bring about change. And so when we're talking about climate change, instead of arguing between carbon capture and, 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 you know, and all the various bits and pieces up here. What we need to actually spend a lot of time on is people's fears and hopes and, and how it relates to their values and so forth. I mean, how, how many of our politicians who are against, who are saying climate change is not real and all this sort of thing, and, and then they profess all this sort of religious belief <laughs> and spirituality. And, and loving this, you know, it's, it's, they just don't go together. They, they really need a therapy session, most of them. So, and I am available. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Um, and again, we can see this, for example, if you look at the issue of peace, um, people might think, well, peace is going to be an absence of war. And then you say, well, it's really an absence of violence. And, and then you've got inequities between cultures, so you need to have intercultural peace, and then if you're into Gaia, you know, and so forth, until you get way out there and you actually realize there's a connection between peace out there and peace inside. And that's what I mean, in a sense, by permaculture of the inner landscape. You can't have processes to bring about peace, global peace out there, when you've got violent insides in the people who are sitting around the table. You've got to have, have that peace 
from the inside. That's the foundation from which we're going to have permaculture too, in a sense. Next one. Now, I'm not saying none of this is going on now. It's, it's not a critique of, of present permaculture. It's just trying to look, you know, what are the best ways to progress it. So this, this personal stuff is generally denied in our society. And I think if you're going to have global transformation, you've got to have organizational and institutional transformation. Different political systems, economic systems, educational systems, health systems, all that sort of stuff. But you can't have those unless you have, as I say, that inner process of change, personal transformation. Okay? And when, when that comes down to action, if those three things are important, we're going to need to think about what can I do personally, what can I do in relation to institutions, and what can I do in relation to planetary and global things. Next one. Yeah. So I'm a social ecologist. Um, and people say, what's social ecology? You could go to the next one too. Um, social ecology is about this very sort of thing, about integrating the personal, social, ecological in relation to sustainability and well-being and community and, 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 um, and so forth. And if you looked at it in terms of the three most important things we think about is the personal, the social and political and environmental and in a sense that's encompassed by a big sort of area of the unknown which some people might call spiritual. Um, I tend to think of it as the unknown and I'll explain why that is in a moment. So I think social ecology provides a very good foundation for the sort of stuff that I'm talking about and advocating. Um, in some ways it's a critique of the way our society runs, even the triple bottom line. The triple bottom line is the economy, society, and the environment. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not an equitable process. It's a transition process. Next one, yeah. Um, this has a value as a stepping stone to where we need to go. But actually the economy is one of the institutional structures and processes that's part of society. To separate it out as something that's different from society um, is the problem. And to not include the personal um, means that everything's got to be fixed up somewhere out there. You know, when people point, there's usually three fingers pointing at themselves and one pointing at the thing they're blaming. <laughs> and, and so because the personal isn't included there, because we're not society. We're actually individuals. We're social organisms, but we're not society. Society is our institutional structures. So next one. And, and this is the sort of system we have, you know, business interests um, and everything else. <laughs> next one. Um, and th this is the sort of greenwashing that goes on and token, token environmentalism and so forth, yeah. So taking into account governance for well-being, I'm arguing in our system that dominant, with a dominant emphasis on economics um, prevents us from taking well-being seriously. Next one. Um, these folks um, did a very good cartoon, I think, to illustrate this because you just actually can't give this because of the economic dominance. It's just not even visible most of the time. And you, and you see that when you, when you talk to people about it. They say, well, we'll deal with the environment when we can afford to. <laughs> or we'll, we'll, we'll look after people who are starving to death when we've sort of got more of a profit and we can pay for it. And you, know, and you stand back and look at how we live. Most of what's going on in our society is rubbish. 
you know. I mean, a friend of mine made it most clear to me, he said, he's a nutritionist, he said, you go into the supermarket and really as a nutritionist I can tell you one thing to do. It's not very complicated and that one thing is keep out of the centre aisles, you know, because there's foods around the perimeter. There's fruit and vegetables down one side and if you're a meat eater, there's meat down, down the back and then there's some bread in the corner, you know. And the middle has got food that makes a noise when you pour milk on it, for which you have zero need. You know, it's just rubbish. And that's where all the money goes, you know. So, next one, yeah. So, and keep going. Um, my triple bottom line is that the planet and the environment and the ecological systems and nature actually have absolute requirements. And to, to achieve that, um, next one, yeah. Um, we need institutional structures that can enable us to, ha to design ways of living on this planet that, that meet those absolute requirements of nature that enable us all to live. And next one. And we, and we need people who understand that to construct those institutions to do that. And that, in a sense, is what a real triple bottom line is, where, where we're creating institutional structures, which includes economics, with all these other institutional structures, but not privileging economics, um, to enable us to do that. Okay. Next one. Um, and it's also helpful when we're thinking about um, bringing about change is, and learning to do that. In our society, learning is usually thought of as something involving the head. And it's, it's usually sort of thought of like pouring something into the head. Um, all the rest of it pretty much gets left out or is an, is an additional sort of activity that's not really too much to do with learning. But really whole person learning must involve all of these things. And primarily it involves not pouring something in, but providing opportunities for acting out, <laughs> you know, for, for doing something. Uh, and particularly when you come to this area is what is your mission? What is your agenda on this planet? What do you, what do you want to do with your life? And most people are lost around that because we don't actually spend a lot of time helping that. Um, so to get into the psychology of this, and this is the real hard bit of the presentation, keep going. Um, my assumption is that at every moment we're always doing the best we can, and keep going, given three things. What we inherited in a sense as genetics, our past experiences, and the present environment. And it's an interaction between these things that determine what we do. Next one. And you can see that here. So it's an interaction between the person and their genetics, their present environment, and the past environment that determines how they develop their morals and ethics and values and feelings and all those things that I showed in that triangle and that determines um, how we act. So if we want to change things, we've actually got to think about um, how can we recover from past experiences that have been wounding to us and how can we pro provide present environmental conditions that enable us to operate in the very best possible way. And in schools, having kids all sit in rows and, and do what the teacher says is the last thing that's going to do that. As a child, when you, if you think back, I mean, I, I was a rebellious child, so it was very clear to me. You really have two choices. You can go along with somebody else's learning agenda for you, in which case you get patted on the head and you get told you're a good boy or a good girl. And, or you can rebel, in which case you're told you're a, you're a, a, a rebel and a disruption. Um, now that's not going to make a healthy society. And that's what our history has been, is the creation of fairly unhealthy societies, which is why we're in the mess we're in. So continue. Um, and this is how it happens. We all start out, in a sense, as a whole person. And what happens is we get bashed in. 
if you, if you take birth, it's set up for the convenience of the doctor. It's not set up for the, for the op optimal situation for the child or the mother, but it's for the convenience of the doctor. Um, and, you know, the, you, you've been in a, in a womb, in a dark area, warm on all sides. Suddenly you come into a, a room full of fluorescent lighting. You know, it's no wonder that people have visions of seeing Jesus Christ, you know, because the, the, the doctor had a halo around him, the first thing you saw, you know, and all these sort of things. It's a very frightening thing. And then, you know, getting fed, you see the rubbish that's put into children's mouths, you know. And most kids, the first time they taste this rubbish that you buy in the supermarket, they go... <laughs> Well, the parent, having paid for this shit, scrapes it all back up and sticks it back in. And you get the first primary lesson as a child, you've got to swallow the shit to get the good stuff, which is love. And that sort of symbolically is what's happened to us as a society. I mean, you just open the newspaper, it's full of, full of this, that sort of uncomposted material. Um, so carry on. Um, and so this happens many times. This, oppression stuff and bashing in. And so we develop two selves, um, or two types of selves. We've still got our essential core self, and the core self is spontaneous, aware, empowered, loving, it has able, capable of informed action. The, the, the wounded self that got bashed in, um, had, the only way you can survive it is to develop pattern behaviors. So the kids that's clipped over the head repeatedly, ducks, you know. And I, I, as a teacher in university, I used to wander around and throw my arms all around. And I'd be walking up a corridor and students on either side and I'd be going like this. And I'd just glance to the side and there were like a third of the students were ducking as my hand went up in their 20s. You know, they still were stuck in this pattern behavior of seeing a hand going up meant you were going to be clipped. And, and that is just the tip of the iceberg of how automatic most of us are most of the time. We close off our awareness, um, we give up power, and we, we get fearful about things, and then we act out or we postpone. And that's a dominant behavior for most of us, most of the time. You know, if we're going to bring about the change that's required in our society, we've actually got to move over from here to here. And the, the greatest indicator of it is spontaneity. The difficulty of talking about this is the primary strategy that all of us have for dealing with this is denial. So there will be feelings in the room at the moment, what's he talking about? <laughs> um, because that's how we've survived, is to deny. It's not, it's not um, a bad thing. It's enabled us to survive to now, to some extent. But if we're going to change, we've actually got to overcome that denial. Next one. I think the person who made it most clear, um, this, this difficulty of talking about it and overcoming denial, was R.D. Lang, a Scottish psychiatrist. He said, it's as if we are hypnotized twice, again. Firstly, into accepting pseudo-reality as reality, and again. And secondly, into believing we weren't hypnotized. And that's why it's difficult to talk about it, and why it's difficult to recognize it. And so, you can see that in every area in our society. Um, that we're, we go along with things that really don't make sense. Carry, carry on. So this individual is, is sort of classically in that situation. The number of people who are in jobs, you know, well, I don't really enjoy this job, but really don't have much choice. Or they see oppression going on around them, you know, somebody being um, oppressive to women or something. You know, why didn't you say anything? Well, I couldn't really say anything, you know, I might have lost my job, you know. Like that's the choices people make every day to some extent. Or watching the telly, you know. <laughs> it's the double hypnosis. Next one. 
And the problem with it is, it, what happens with this is you get a limited view of things. <laughs> and it's not always the best view. <laughs> Next one. Um, and one of the other outcomes is we get very easily satisfied by a little bit of gain. Like reduce, reuse, recycle. Wow, we're really moving in the blue mountains. Next one. You know, and that's just, those were only about a third of the R's I came up with. Um, and this is just one letter in one alphabet, and there are many alphabets. So it's, it's really important to know that there's lots more. And again, it also can easily be a situation where it looks like everything's fine because you don't see the whole picture. Um, it looks like the guy's sawing logs. Um, but this is sort of what the situation we're in with climate change, in a way. Um, and most proposals to address this are really things that are essentially are slowing down the rate of soaring. You know, it's not changing the relationship, which is why permaculture is important, because it's a design approach. It's how do you redesign that? system. Next. And again. Okay, psychology I've done. Um, I mentioned ecology as a basis for the design. Um, as as uh, Pat said, I did one of the first real studies of whole, whole ecology of ecological systems. And really there are only three things as an ecologist when you go out to try and study another species you ask. Um, or four things. How many are there? How are they distributed? What are they doing? And what are their relationships with one another and the environment and so forth? So those are questions of numbers, distribution, and activities. So if we're going to be objective about our own species, we've got to ask how many is optimum? How should and shouldn't we distribute ourselves? What should and shouldn't we do? How should and shouldn't we relate and interact with the environment? So next one. So if you look at that, the same sort of idea, if you have, um, well, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide, but it, it's an interaction between these things that determine how much resources we use. So if you've got a lot of high numbers, I mean, yeah, high numbers, highly aggregated and highly consumptive, you're going to use a lot of resources and have a lot of environmental impact and be unsustainable. So next one. So this just lays it out. That's what I just said. If you, if you, have, if you want to survive, you've got to have, um, oh, this, yeah, this is essentially what I just said, so the next one. So if, if you want to survive, you've got to have numbers that are relative to the carrying capacity located close to the resources it needs with a conserver lifestyle and, and working within that carrying capacity. So it's not very complicated, you know. But if you look at even the people in the environmental movement have invariably come up with a single answer, like Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb. All we've got to do is control the population. Um, if you look at Barry Commoner, who was another environmentalist, all you've got to do is control our consumption, um, and so forth. Well. Real ecologists would say we've actually got to do all of these things um, in relation to the carrying capacity. So these are foundational concepts and it involves e-collaboration. Next one. One of the key concepts in, in uh, ecology that's particularly coming to the fore in understanding that whole relationship with carrying capacity and survival and uh, sustainability is the concept of resilience. And I just go through these. So that's a definition of resilience, and again. Um, so it's dependent on uh, the interactions between the genetic, historical, and contextual factors. Um, what increases it is capital building processes in ecosystems. And that's what permaculture is able to do. It builds capital. It builds um, capability within the system to, to survive um, disruptions and, and, and so forth. And again, 
um, and resilience on the other hand is reduced by capital eroding processes which is what most of the dominant sort of things that we do in the environment are. Next one. So go through this fairly quickly. Um, this is just to show the relationships between individuals and their species and where we live and the planet. Keep going. And when you get to the arrows, stop. Okay. Um, it's just to say that we're dealing with whole systems that are all interactive with one another and it doesn't matter where you start. People say, oh, you've got to start at the individual or you've got to start at the species. Wherever you start, you've just got to start knowing that all those other bits are connected and, and that you're working with the whole picture. So it, having pictures in your head of ma like a map in a sense of what you're dealing with is very helpful to use your efforts effectively. Next one. So in a sense what I'm saying is our failure to do that has caused social misery and environmental degradation and again and so we I would argue that we need to learn from psychology which I've already talked about and ecology, which I'm talking about now, to develop better systems of doing things. For me, this is most illustrated clearly in agriculture, where the, the producer, it's interesting that the farmer is referred to as the producer, <laughs> and is only rewarded for productivity. And again, when you do that, you erode the natural capital and the ecological integrity of the system and again. Whereas if the farmer is rewarded for rehabilitation and maintenance of the system, you build natural capital and establish the basis for sustained productivity. And that's why many years ago I got interested in organic farming, primarily because when you ask people why are you willing to pay more for organic food, they said, I think it's better for my health and I think it's better for the environment. And it's the beginning of a culture being willing to pay for maintenance. Now that's what's needed in every sector of our society. Is, and that's what sustainability means. Sustainability is about maintaining healthy systems and rehabilitating systems so they can become healthy. Keep going. The part of why it isn't paid much attention to is historically much maintenance in our culture has been carried out by women and taken for granted and unpaid and most productivity, these are just male and female signs, has been carried out um, by men or at least the, the saleable productivity has been carried out by men um, and rewarded um, disproportionately. So it's a gender issue, yeah. Now, following on from the psychology and the ecology, the other thing, and linking back to what I was saying about the difference between socializing and enabling, um, I think we're in a process of evolving psychosocially. So keep going. Part of the problem at the moment is that most proposals for, for, for solving our problems, when you look at them closely, are often like trying to find more efficient ways to do what we used to do, not to do things differently. Keep going. Um, and again. Um, so, you know, you have to think, I said, said about the problems with economics. What if we had a society that wasn't obsessed with economics? Keep going. And actually made decisions on the basis of our values. Yeah, um, and again. Um, this is a very controversial piece of research by Lloyd DeMaus, but he argues if you want to understand human history, you need to look historically how children were raised. And if you look at how children have been raised historically, we've gone through an evolution from practicing infanticide to abandonment. Um, I was sent away to boarding school, so abandonment was still going on. Um, to an ambivalence and intrusive, to socializing. Socializing is what I 
talked about earlier. And what I'm arguing for is we need to move to enabling. I, I won't go on there because it's, it's explained a bit more in the next slide. And again. Okay. So, so this is you know, a statement about socialising, pretty much what I've just said. And again. And as I say, really the choice of an individual in a socialising society is to either conform or rebel. Now, an enabling approach, next one, is a different thing. And again, um, it, 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 I, I, it's, it, we probably won't have time to do it, but at the end of my presentation, I've got a little bit more, um, which if we have time, is on a thing called the Peckham Experiment, where kids were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do uh, over a 15-year period um, and there were about nearly 2,000 families that were involved in this. And people would say, oh, that's going to be a catastrophe if kids are allowed to do what they want to do. There wasn't a single case in 15 years. Now, I don't know where else in the world you can show that. The children didn't actually choose to play competitive games. Now, you start, when, you know, when you start saying, if we didn't, make decisions on the basis of economics and keep everything going as it is, what would it be like? Well, it might be a society where we don't play competitive games, <laughs> or at least in the way we do now. Um, and there wasn't a single marriage breakdown as a divorced person. It sort of kicks me up the bum. Next one. So. The, the, the capacity of those people was amazing. They wrote symphonies and plays and all sorts of things. And the whole experiment was set up to try and understand what were the causes of health. I don't know a doctor today who is familiar with the findings of the Peckham experiment. It's not on the curriculum for becoming a, a medical practitioner. It's the only piece of, of long-term large-scale research that's been done on health ever. <laughs> and it's not taught to doctors. Next one. I just want to say a little bit about the problem solving. I mentioned that. I'll go through this very quickly. Um, when we focus on problems, um, in a sense, it causes us to focus on symptom management, which is what, what pests are, for example, and diseases. And again, um, and as I said, this endless m measuring of problems, and again, and, and then the efficient use of these interventions, and then the search for substitutive interventions, like searching for biological controls instead of pesticides. So you no more suffer from a pest in a field because of a deficiency of pesticide than you do from a deficiency of praying mantids. It's, it's the design of the system that causes the pest, not a single thing like a, a pray, you know, the need for a praying mantid or a pesticide. Keep going. Um, and it's, this is the same in every area, not just pest control. But I'll illustrate it in pest control. Next one. Um, if this was your garden or farm, you could say symbolically it runs smoothly for part of its operation and then part it doesn't. And where it doesn't, it spins off problems, which in this case might be a pest. And what we might do is spray a pesticide and most of it misses the pest. Um, and so that's a conventional approach to pest control. Next one. What we try to do is be efficient with our application of the pesticide. And again, or we bring in a biological control as a predator, jaws, or a little parasite that's going to parasitize it. Now, the, the illusion with this is that the more effective you are with those strategies, the more you protect and perpetuate the design that's generating the problem. And that's what goes on in every aspect of our society. This isn't just about pest. Yeah, next one. So what we've got to do is redesign that system so we take those bumps out of it so that when a problem arises, there's enough within the system to solve that problem internally. And you haven't got to reach for an external solution to an internal problem. Next one. 
So if you look at that in relation to sustainability, you can get a few gains through efficiency, which is what insulating houses and doing all those sort of things are about. You can get some more with substitution where we get substitutive energy and substitutive um, other products and so forth. Same in medicine. No, no, go back. Um, and, um, but it's not till you get to redesign and I think there are multiple layers of redesign, just like I think permaculture can exceed its present form. Um, because we're still very naive about design. We're, we're incredibly good at efficiency and substitution, but we're not very good yet at design. If you take agriculture, there is not a single course on design in any agricultural program in the world. If you go and do a degree in agriculture, there's no subject called uh, e agro-ecosystem design. <laughs> the design is taken as given, which is a highly controlled, simplified model, <laughs> which is, of course, designed to have problems. Next one. So we go through these other ones quite quickly. So that, that's the classic field that you see, which, as I say, is producing a little bit of real food and a whole lot that makes noise when you pour milk on it. Next one. You have a a conventional solution. The thing that makes this thing a pest is its economic properties. You cannot design a poison that's selective on the basis of economics. It just kills everything. There's no such thing as a pesticide. They're all biocides. They're anti-life. They kill life. There's no, it's, a, it's a marketing scam to call it a pesticide. They're not specific. They cannot be specific. Because there's nothing that makes a weevil that eats your crops different from a weevil that eats a weed in terms of the, the effects of the chemical. Next one. So we come in with an efficiency approach, get a better nozzle on the sprayer, or we bring in a predator and scare the shit out of the pest. And what happens? Next one. We protect and perpetuate the design that generated the problem. When the next one, what we've got to do is redesign that system, which is why partly why permaculture is so exciting to me. But there's a lot of people in permaculture that don't understand that the important, this aspect of the importance of this. So I, you know, I just wanted to mention some of that. Next one. So yeah, go through this fairly quickly. Um, so what we're doing, we need to do next, is to redesign the, the system and enable change within our institutional structures to enable that to happen. And again, and Pretty much, we've got to, we've got to learn to um, work with, with complex, much more complex systems. And this is, this is not an ever so complex system, but it's certainly more complex than the, the average agricultural system. Next one. Now, I want to say a bit about yeomans and, and key line um, and, and, and how you know, we come to understand working with whole systems. In our society, we tend to only focus on little bits within systems, usually the attractive bit. You know, if you look at conservation of wildlife in Australia, so sort of everybody is worried about koalas and things like this. You know, if I said, what about the proctotrupid wasps? <laughs> or, you know, if people say, I don't know what bloody wasps are. But wasps are bad, aren't they? <laughs> Um, so, we, you know, we see the flower. Next one. But it's the bits we don't see within most systems that enable them to function. You know, socially, the people who get the work done without being obvious about it. And in, in, ag in terrestrial systems, it's what goes on in the soil. And this is what I spend most of my sort of research life studying. And, a whole lot of these animals are, are named after me because I discovered them. So I thought with a name like Hill, there would be nothing. But the smallest beetle in the world is, um, in fact, the, the next one, I think. Oh, no, it's, it's not the next one. But anyway, yeah, keep going. Is, is named, is Microdina hilly. <laughs> um, but so, this, you know, this is the carrot and the onion you don't see when you pull it up. So the carrot root goes down a couple of meters. So the most of the carrot is this in a sense. And that's what enables the carrot to be the carrot that we know as the carrot. And 
that soil has not got to be good for this bit, it's got to be good for this bit. I carry on. And so when we don't manage and design systems that can work, we end up with, with them collapsing. Next one. And this, in a sense, was Yeomans way back in the 40s, looking at the landscape um, in North Richmond um, on the farm that he bought. Next one. And here's Yeomans out in his field. Um, and next one. And he, he and I'll, I'll explain, and you'll, you'll be familiar with this bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but next one. He, he was able to make an inch of topsoil in three years on land that was, was declared very uh, poor quality land in, in North Richmond. Um, and um, normally, if you look in a textbook on soils, it will say it takes 300 to 3,000 years to make an inch of topsoil. So this is, he was able to do this on land, essentially hopeless land. Next one. Um, because he, he recognized that agriculture and, and our food system is a production consumption recycle system and the recycle bit is what's going on in the soil. That's what maintains the system. We f over focus on production and consumption and we neglect waste and we neglect the decomposer system in the soil. Next one. And these are some of these animals. This is the, the beetle that is a member of this group, the Tiliad beetles with this Microdina hilly. <laughs> so this is, when you're sitting down on the grass, this is what's going on, on underneath something r rhymes with grass. <laughs> um, it's decomposition. And there, there are basically two major food chains that go on in the soil. In the water film around the particles, there's bacteria being fed on by protozoa and nematodes and rotifers. And then into the air spaces, there's fungi being browsed by mites and springtails, and all of these things are being eaten by predators. And you may have a thousand different species in a, in a square meter of, of land um, that are carrying on maintaining the fertility of that piece of of land. Now you put a pesticide on there and it just indiscriminately kills off a whole lot of those things and then a whole lot of processes can't be carried on and so we then become dependent on, on more pesticides and more fertilizers and so forth. So these are the guys that you've got to fall in love with if you really want to have a, a, a permaculture system. Next one. The other thing that, that Yeomans realized was that he was working with his livestock, his pasture, his water, his soils, his marketing of his produce, and the biodiversity. And for that, he, he needed to decide what he wanted to do, how he was going to go about it. And that boiled down to where to do things, when to do things, what to do, and how to do it. And that's, in a sense, a holistic plan for any piece of, of landscape management. Next one. When he looked at his, his landscape, he said, if I look at that whole landscape in terms of what influence I can have, if I organize it in terms of things I can do nothing about to things I can do something about, this was the order in which he came up with. He didn't think he could do much about the climate, although we proved him wrong lately, um, and, the, and the total landscape. Um, <coughs> But what came out at the bottom was soil was something he felt he could do something about. And so he designed a system for managing that landscape that worked with the soil. Next one. And this is him and Alan who markets his, his plow and Ken, his son, who, um, who sells, um, uh, who, who's a consultant for Keyline. And uh, while I'm talking about key line, I presume you all know that, that permaculture is partly based on key line. Um, although early on it wasn't very well acknowledged. Um, next one. These are the books he wrote. 
And I think these are, should be foundational reading for permaculture, at least some of them. I, w I think particularly his Challenge of Landscape was the first um, sort of major book he wrote. Um, and this is the one that's currently available by, it's been edited by his son. Next one. And this is what his landscape looked like in North Richmond and it still very much looks like that although as you can imagine it's prime land for developers with all these lovely dams on them and rolling hills and, uh, and so forth. Next one. And this was um, a pic about 10 or so years later. You can see a lot of the trees he planted had grown up but also some of the development had started to happen. And right now, next one, there's um, a plan to remove a whole lot of these dams um, and um, the person who bought it from Yeomans has just sold it for 40 million. Um, and there's a developer who paid for the, um, the, the uh, political fees for the local council uh, to, to get the, the planning passed and so forth and so forth. Of course, I'm being recorded, aren't I? So I should probably be, I'm libelous now. Anyway, there's a whole lot of literature on this and how, what's been going on. And um, this is some of the um, sort of planning, if, saying if that's going to happen, this is a way it could be done that still preserved some of that integrity of that landscape. Next one. So what, what Yeomans did was he noticed that, and his eldest son was Neville Yeomans, who I interviewed for a book um, about all this stuff. And he said every time it rained, his dad said, get your wellies on, we're going out to see what happens to the water. And they went out and um, what he noticed, because it's a hilly land like that, if you notice the hill is convex and then it's concave, and he noticed that at the junction where it changed from convex to concave, um, when it rained really heavily, it started to get sort of silvery. So there was water leaking out at that point up the slope. And he realized that if you could put a dam at that point, that was the highest point on the slope where you could most easily collect water, the excess water that was coming out, leaking out of the slope. And then you could use that to irrigate all the lower lower fields. Next one. He also wanted that, that water to travel the greatest distance between it falling and reaching the river and the, and the ocean. And so he developed a plough which he called the, the uh, key line plough. Um, and he, below the, the key point he, he uh, ploughed slightly down from the slope and, um, and above it, he ploughed um, just slightly above the, of the contour. So, so the, the water that fell on the upper land was focused down, drained down to the dam, which was, would be here, and the water that, that fell below would be distributed the greatest distance down that slope. And when he irrigated from that dam, the water could flow in through those channels um, and next one you'll see what I mean. This is the plough. People say, oh, I don't want to plough in my field. You can see that plough doesn't disturb the field at all if it's done properly. Next one, and you can see this is what the plough is. So it, it's actually a device that creates a channel below the soil so that when it rains, the water can travel and irrigate the greatest distance. And this can be uh, set up at different heights. Next one. Um, so the first year you plough fairly shallow, the next year you plough a bit deeper and the next year you plough a bit deeper. And so what you're doing is increasing the, the area that the, the grass roots can penetrate. Grass is path has pathetic roots. It's not like dandelions or thistle. Thistles are like drilling rigs. <laughs> but um, and if you look around Richmond, the areas that, um, where they've done key line ploughing have no thistles. And the next door neighbour that haven't, hasn't done key line ploughing is full of thistles because the thistle is doing the job of the plough or the plough is doing the job of the thistle. 
it, and the reason why the, the thistle's there is it, it has an advantage because it can get down that profile and get the nutrients. Once you open up that profile to the grass, the grass can get down there and get the nutrients and outcompete the thistle. So it's a design approach to managing weeds. Next one. Next one. Yeah. And this is just showing, you know, how amazing roots are and the role of compost, for example, in stimulating root growth. This, this is uh, just an experiment, just showing that. Next one. And again. Yeah, so just keep going with these. These are these is just summarizing the conceptual basis for yeomans. And, and just stop there for a second. In some ways, these are the conceptual basis for some aspects of permaculture. Learning from nature, creating something rather than just conserving it. Um, working with a hierarchy of where's the best thing to start working, um, working with ecosystem processes, and, and if you're going to use inputs, use them very, very specifically. Next one. And the same thing, we can just go. So these are the e ecological processes going on. It was working with those processes in nature and, and also using nature as a model. Um, and paying attention to what's going on in nature. Next one. And um, the outcomes, yeah, you can just go through all of these until um, we get to the bottom. Um, you know, I think there may even be one more. Is there another? No, there isn't. Oh, sorry. But, you know, you don't just get a sustainable ecosystem. You get biodiversity conservation, well-being, even non-violence and peace and, and climate amelioration. And Alan Yeomans did a calculation finding that if you did Yeomans type ploughing uh, management on the whole of Australia where you could do it, we'd capture more carbon on that land than we release into the atmosphere from total fossil fuel burning in Australia. Now it's not that that's the solution <laughs> to climate change. It only just buys us time because that what you can't do that year after year after year because you reach a threshold. But it's, it's an important thing. It's about the only thing from my perspective that the opposition has said sensible relating to climate change. <laughs> Next one. Okay. Um, I think this is another very important thing to understand and it's, it's sort of leading into what I want to say about wisdom. Next one. This is the sum total of human knowledge. This is the rest. This is what we're talking about when we talk about evidence-based thinking. <laughs> now, what's evidence-based decision-making going to get you? It's going to get you ignoring most of what is. <laughs> okay. We engage with this through wisdom. We engage with this through cleverness. If we're going to solve our problems and move forwards, we've got to become better at working with the unknown, intuitively um, and in various other ways. Next one. I think Einstein put it best. He said, clever people know how to solve problems. Wise people avoid them. This is what we teach. This is an extracurricular activity. Until we nurture wisdom, we're going to be continuing to be in trouble. Next one. Um, I have a website that's got a whole um, PowerPoint on, on wisdom, and that's the, the website if anybody wants to see it. But one of the first things, next one, uh, that's on that site is the first piece of wisdom for me is ask of everything that you are about to do, wh why are you doing it? You know, what is it in the service of? And if you look at, I mean, I worked for many years as a psychotherapist. And one of the things you sometimes do as a psychotherapist is get people to keep a diary, a very honest diary of everything they do, moment to moment, day after day. <laughs> and then they analyze what, how they spend their time. And of course what they find is 
that most of the time is, is wasted doing nothing of importance because it's, it's been behaving automatically, not, in, not evaluated to be in the service of anything important or anything related to their values. Next one. Um, and so we neglect wisdom. Next one. So, and I think that's the thing, wisdom cannot be supported by data alone. It's so, there is some data that supports wisdom, but working with the unknown is a different sort of thing. And so we get into trouble when we over-focus on the, the known. Next one. When 9-11 occurred, several of us were asked to um, make a statement for a newspaper, and this is what I said. You can put the next I said, all those who have it figured out from whatever angle are the problem. If the world is going to change, it will be by enough of us being willing to not know so that a new kind of knowing might emerge. And I think that's, in a sense, even applies to permaculture. It's like, it's, it's acknowledging what you don't know about permaculture that's going to enable you to progress permaculture. And it's a paradoxical understanding, in a sense. Next one. So, to understand that, keep going, um, and again, what happens is, it's like a spiral between knowing and unknowing. You've got to be in unknowing to learn, and you've got to be in knowing to act. And the key is to move as fast as you can, in a sense, between knowing and unknowing. Where you, you try something, and you have questions about it, and you watch what happens, you have questions about what happens, and that takes you back into unknowing. And you reflect on it, and then you go around again. <coughs> and what you know, I mean, if you think of all your friends, there'll be, you'll have friends who spend their whole life in unknowing. Oh, I don't know. Their answer is always, oh, I don't know. And, and they're always getting ready to act. Because they're, they're, they're never quite competent enough to do anything. And then on their grave it will say, spent my life getting ready to live, never actually lived. <laughs> you know. Then there are other people who know everything. You can't tell them anything. You know, I remember the, the old joke with a woman who had a pile of encyclopedias at the end of her driveway, t t feel free to take them away. And somebody said, why would you give away your Encyclopedia Britannica? She said, oh, my husband knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. And keep going. So th this is just a nice image. Is I think with that unknowing, you know, it's a bit like most of what is is out of sight. And so the future might be a lot more hopeful than we think. Because there's a lot out there that can answer our problems that we haven't really engaged with yet. Next one. And again. So I'm just saying we also need to not put old farts like me out to pasture too soon too, because <laughs> we might have something to contribute. That wasn't the main aim of the slide. But. <laughs> Next one. Okay, and again. Now, just to end up, I want to say, say a bit about change. People who do important change are invariably ridiculed. These are the dinosaurs ridiculing the early mammals. I see, I didn't see it. Next one. The thing is that change goes through a number of stages and goes through. The first is ignorance and denial, and then you've got awareness. Oh, yeah, there may be such a thing as climate change. And then we say, well, yeah, I think that we probably need to develop some abilities to do something about this. And that gets converted into projects. And that's usually where it ends. Where we've got to get to is this next stage where this is the way we live not where being sensible is a project. <laughs> you know, it's, it's moving to where people don't say, oh yeah, permaculture, that's a good thing. Say, no, we, we, we pretty much all do permaculture. <laughs> that's where we've got to get to. Okay, keep going. Um, yeah, you know, you're, you're pretty much for sure going to be in a minority if you're in the process of change. There he is. <laughs> Next one. Um, 
Yeah, and I think paradox is usually a key thing for understanding things. I won't go on about these, but I just sow these seeds. Next one. Okay, these are the things that are listed here that people say when you say, why can't we get on and do this? And let's just go, go through that list now. Um, oh, we don't have enough information. Oh, we need some money. Oh, we need some policies to enable us to do it. You know, these are the things that people say, oh, these are the excuses. We can't do it because um, we need more information. So we've got endless collecting information, endless trying to set up funds for this and that, endless processes of, of policy discussions and so forth. Has it led to much change? Not very much. Next one. And keep going. We do need some political things. Basically, if you're setting up processes of change politically, you need to think of these three things, supports, rewards, and penalties. Next. Supports include those sort of things, and they need to be ongoing things. Rewards need to be temporary things like tax incentives and subsidies and so forth. And penalties need to be things to, to deal with people who insist on behaving like idiots. So those, you know, and again, you've got to do all of these things. It's, people say, oh, you've, we need an education program. That'll solve it. You need all of those things. You cannot do it with one of them. Okay, next. So these are the things that I think are underlying this, thinking back to my psychological things. So keep going. Um, our own family and community, you know, if you've got a member of your family who, who s ridicules you every time you, you, know, you say you want to do something, that can be very hard. Next one. Um, empowerment. If you've been disempowered and you don't believe you can make a difference. You know, I used to work with people on empower empowerment. And um, this is it. I'll show you. Let's show, show, let's, let's. I'm Stuart and you're pleased to meet me. <laughs> right. Until you can do that, you know, you're disempowered. <laughs> and, and not just that, but, but I'm sure you're pleased to meet me. Ha ha! Now, if you go, ha ha! You need to work on it. Awareness. I, I can't see the climate change, you know. Have some vision and imagination. And the next one, values, worldviews, paradigms. And next one, and overcoming these things. These, I think, are the real underlying things that are the barriers to change, the things that we've actually got to address to enable people to be empowered enough, aware enough, with enough vision and imagination, clearer about their values, and overcoming procrastination and denial and bugger the family if they aren't in support. Get them on side. So if you're looking at change, keep going with this one. And again. You know, if we look at international development, we see technology transfer, then we get problem solving, then we get education. Keep going. And what we've eventually got to get to is human development. Because if you're going to deal with complex systems over the long term, you're going to have to get out there, which is eventually having to deal with human development. You can't do it with these things, even education. It's more, more than education. Next one. So these are coming to the end now. The actual nitty gritty of bringing about change, just keep going through these. You know, what are you going to stop doing? What are you going to reduce doing? What are you going to do differently? What are you going to increase doing? What are you going to do new that you've never done before? That's any, any change can be boiled down to those things. Next one. And keep going. Um, what will it take to do this? What gets in the way? How can you remove those things? What do you need to do it? How are you going to get those things? Keep going. And just keep going. It's a deeply personal thing, context specific, and that's why formulaic, centrally organized things never work. They always lead to problems and again, and cause more problems. So again, 
you know, what are we trying to come up with? All the whole thing about the, the um, you know, is it going to be Nauru or is it going to be Malaysia? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a catastrophe because it, it, it's not a complex, diverse, flexible, etc. solution. It's a formulaic, centrally conceived thing that's a compromise and so forth. Next one. I mean, in a sense, change is very simple. If you're over here and miserable and you want to get here and happy, keep going. There are some things that take you over there. There are some things keeping you back here. Keep going. You've got to add to and strengthen those, and you've got to remove and weaken these. Next one. And some of these, you've got to recognize, some of these are external, and some of them are internal. Next one. Keep going. So these are sort of things you've got to do. Prioritize, brainstorm, break down to doable things. Not Olympic events. Like when you've been disempowered, what happens is we get attracted to, to we sign up for things we can't do to compensate for our internal sense of powerlessness. So a real key is to learn to take on doable things. Okay, next one. We really are coming to the end here. So this is just... For example, if you were getting together a real big plan for a, a landscape, I, like this is what I use with farmers, um, what do they want to achieve beyond an average lifetime for themselves, their family, their enterprise, their local community, the local landscape? And then bringing that right back down to what are you going to do before you go to bed tonight to contribute to that long-term goal? Next one. Now, psychologically, over the years, I've, I've been trying to come up with, like in working with workshops, I mean, if this was a, a full day workshop, I'd be doing this with you. I'd have you lying about what you've done that you haven't actually done. Um, next one, yeah, and this is why it works. Um, this, of course, is a lie, this picture. <laughs> You shouldn't think. <laughs> um, the paradox is, if you are, like, what we do in our society, we do visioning exercises. And if you go back to my picture of the, 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 the round thing that got bashed in, when you ask people to vision, what happens is a, a subconscious dialogue goes on between your essence, your empowered self, and all your disempowered selves. And your empowered self says, oh, this would be good. And then all the disempowered selves say, oh, you can't say that, particularly not in front of the neighbors. Or dirty, 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 dirty. And I was been running these visioning workshops for years. And I was so frustrated one day, I just spontaneously said, what I want you to do is go back into your pairs and lie completely over the top how you made your whole farm completely sustainable. These were a bunch of grazers. And it was amazing. The energy in the room transformed. And afterwards, I said, you know, somebody got one they want to share. And this grazer put up his hand. I'm, I'm, I just love working with grazers because they've just got such lovely sort of energy. And he said, oh, I've got one. He says, I put a nature strip right through my 200,000 hectare property 20 years ago. I've been monitoring the bird species ever since. I like those birds. And then he looks down and he says, you know those little bloody dinosaurs? I saw one of those bastards coming out of me nature strip this morning. <laughs> now, when you can get a grazier to be that creative, <laughs> you know you are onto something. And when I then reflected on why that worked is because it's just a lie. Because it's just a lie, all your wounded selves have no role in censoring what, you, what your powerful self wants to say because it doesn't matter. It's just a lie. And so paradoxically, by enabling people to lie about what they've done that they haven't actually done, you get to the essence of who they are. So over the last few years as a teacher in the university, when I was teaching a course, I said to the students, I want you to imagine this isn't the first class, this is the last class of the semester. And I want you in pairs to lie to each other. What were the three most important things you learned during the semester and three things you did to act on that information 
to make your life and the world a better place. And again, massive stuff. And then I mapped all that on the board and that was the semester's curriculum. And what did those students do for the term? They achieved their lives. I didn't have any problems with motivation. And I've done it with politicians. I've had them lie about the three most important things they were able to achieve as a politician. And I haven't had one of them without tears in their eyes. Because that's why they wanted to become a politician in the first place before they got into that gridlocked system. So just to end up, just the ne next couple, and I think that's pretty much the end. Um, it's a process of, of letting go and letting come, in a sense. There's whole books on this. There's a thing called Theory U. Next one. And it's sort of like, you know, letting go of this sort of landscape and letting come a more interesting sort of landscape. Next one. And again. Oh, sorry. Um, if you can bear with me. Um, part of the problem is, in a sense, this is, is, whatever you do, you need to have some testing questions. And so we'll go through this very quickly. Next ones. Um, and again. We need some at the, at the social level. And the pro just keep going through these. Primarily, when people talk about um, societies functioning well, a real big indicator is the level of trust in that society. Um, also, whether they practice celebrations much. Um, the Blue Mountains is great for this, I think. There's, there's a lot more celebrations going on around here sometimes. Um, yeah, and again, next one. Uh, if you look ecologically, this looks a little bit like Mollison, but it actually isn't. But, um, environmentally, w these are testing questions. You know, how is it helping maintain the ecological processes, conserving biodiversity and the habitats and, and evolutionary processes? Okay, next one. And then at the personal level, um, the real indicator of well-being for each of us is spontaneity as opposed to pattern behavior. So these are those things I've just been talking about. These are all indicators. So again, and the next one, when we're thinking about are we being successful and just keep going, um, we need to look not just at single indicators like are we making a profit, gross domestic product or something. Um, we need to look at all these sort of things and probably more besides. You know, are we being proactive or are we being reactive? Uh, are we taking on things that we can achieve? Are we working with the windows of change, the opportunities and so forth? Are we paying attention to what happens and learning from that and changing things? You know, what happens when, when people are confronted with somebody, keep going, yeah, somebody who's deaf, what do they do? They shout louder. You know, we, we're, we're hopeless at changing the way we do things. So these are some of the things we need to do, you know. So for me, these would be things that would be on the permaculture organization's calendar of annual activities, you know, which is, is many, many ways what, we, what is going on, you know, with, with the garden projects and, and, but also this personal stuff of, of being a bit more interested in one another. Like, like interviewing one another, like everybody in the organization, if you all sort of paired off with somebody you didn't know and did extensive interviews on one another, your whole community would transform. You know, it takes a bold step to do that. But we've all got stories to tell. And you know, when people are, are really having a hard time, usually there's hardly anybody they can tell. I just spoke to somebody just now who'd found out they'd got breast cancer. And she said, well, I haven't told my husband yet. I mean, she, she's telling me, you know. I haven't told my husband yet. You know, we, we really have got to overcome those sort of barriers in our society.
Next one. So just, just to wind up, go through this really quickly. This is just a vision. This is the society we live in, where we emphasize these things. This is the sort of society we have a possibility for, one where we emphasize a sense of enough and community and so forth. Next one. And again, just very quickly. You know, driven by market forces, economic rationalism, and a mobile disposable workforce. You know, again, lots of alternatives. These are essentially based on myths. We need better myths for, for a, a better society. So if we're going to move forwards, we need to have a vision of a society we're moving forwards towards. So it helps to have it. You know, not just, oh, it's going to be a conservative society. You know, it needs to be a rich picture, not just a single thing. Next one. So this is just looking at it as an evolution of society, from a supply to a demand-driven, to a network-driven society, to a higher values-driven society, from socialism, so socialization to enablement, towards sustainability and social justice and so forth. Next one. Yeah, and so this is the, the, the really is the final um, summary slide, so keep going. So what I'm saying, we're at a critical threshold in our history as a species and, and all of us already started doing something. Like permaculture is a step in the right direction. So we can pat ourselves on the back that we're connected up with some good stuff and probably a whole lot of other things too. And we need to dare to do some other things and we need to get some more allies. And part of, part of the problem was there's, so, there's permaculture and then there's you know, the, the anti-whaling people and then there's the anti-nuclear people and then there's the solar energy people and so forth. We need to get out of those sandboxes and get together and have joint meetings with one another. You know. Next one. And this is, so I said, what I'm saying is it's, it's not going to be achieved by these mega projects like you know, great big dams or things. It's going to be done by small, meaningful, locally relevant actions and making them contagious. Next one. And this is, this is I think, the last word slide. Next one. And that's what it comes down to, is, is making a personal decision. I can do it. I want to do it. I will do it. Watch me do it. <laughs> Next one. So some of you may have seen this before, but I think it's just a very elegant way to illustrate um, how it's important to see things. Because this just really summarizes so clearly everything I've said up to now, as you can see. Actually, I put it upside down, so I'll put it the right way around. Next one. So this is the right way around, so you can really see it absolutely crystal clear. <laughs> Next one. Now, next one. The point is, that was there in the earlier one. So can you see, everybody see the giraffe? Now, the point is, you will never not be able to see that giraffe again, <laughs> having seen it now. So that's what we've got to do in bringing about change, is get people across that line where you cannot go back. Next, next one. It's, it does take commitment. It, next one. It doesn't work if you're half committed. <laughs> and next one. There's going to be ups and downs on the journey. So you've got to have what I call stickability. And next one. This is my absolute favorite cartoon. Just let people read it and then do the next one. So the last, the last one I think is the next one. Oh no, yeah, where we went. Next one. <laughs> that, this is the last one. So this is a poem written by Elizabeth O'Dell. So I think, you know, sometimes poetry can connect you to, to beyond the evidence-based bits and pieces. So she said, flat outstretched upon a mound of earth I lie, I press my ear against its surface, and I hear far off and deep the measured sound of heart that beats within the ground. And with it pounds in harmony the swift familiar heart in me. 
They pulse as one, together swell, together fall. I cannot tell my sound from earth, for I am part of rhythmic universal heart. And I think that's what it's going to take. Thank you.